right, we've got all three mics, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Mitch Connors. I'm a software engineer at Google and a TOC member of the Istio project. And uh, I'm gonna be moderating this session, so I'd like my panelists to introduce themselves if they would. Is this working? Okay. I'm Nitya Danishkodi, and I'm a software engineer on the console service mesh team. Uh, I'm Keith Maddox. I'm a senior engineering lead uh, on the Open Service Mesh project at Microsoft. I'm John Howard. I'm a software engineer at Google, working on Istio. Hi, I'm William Morgan, uh, one of the creators of Linkerd and CEO of Buoyant. Thanks. So our, our talk today is titled Service Mesh Maturity, Are We There Yet? Uh, so if each of you could weigh in on, on one way that you see kind of service mesh as an industry maturing, uh, and also on one way that maybe you see that we still need to grow. <laughs> Whoever wants in. All right, I'll go, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, maturing, yes. Are we fully there yet? No. Um, you know, one of the ways I've seen that, that we've matured is that it's not so hard to just go install a service mesh now and at least get started on something, right? If you look years past, like even just that hurdle um, was, was quite a bit for some people. Um, there's still a lot of effort to reduce the cost of operations though, um, especially beyond, you know, day zero install. Um, but I think one of the other areas of maturity is kind of the ecosystem. Um, so even once you get your service mesh up and running, um, you know, largely that provides a lot of building blocks, right? You have identity, you have the ability to configure rich, you know, L7 routing rules, do Canary rollouts, uh, but you still have to make use of that to actually get value, right? Um, so there's some tools, you know, some users are building their own things, um, but I think the ecosystem around like just simply creating a deployment and having that automatically canaried, uh, things of that nature, uh, has a lot of room for growth. Yeah, I'll say from our, you know, from kind of the Linkerd perspective, you know, we've been saying the word service mesh since like 2016 or something. And uh, one thing that's really changed for us over the past year or two has been kind of the nature of those conversations where a lot of the early conversations were, you know, very open source heavy and like enthusiastic, you know, uh, audience members and like excited about the technology and wanting to really dive in. And, and that uh, at least what I've seen has changed a bit to, you know, there's still some of that, but a lot of the hype has kind of died off, you know, a little bit. And uh, the conversations we're having now are, are, are with, um, you know, companies that are trying to adopt a service mission and they kind of know they need one and they know they need help in a lot of ways in, in adopting one, you know. So it's, it's shifted from an audience of, you know, people who are enthusiastic and want to do it themselves to people who, uh, maybe are not enthusiastic, but they, you know, they see it as inevitable and, and they know they can't really do it themselves. And so that's been maybe a maturity, uh, you know, more of the, of the audience than of the technology. I think in the, you know, are we there yet? No, I, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of maturity uh, still ahead of us. I think especially when it comes to, you know, kind of to John's point, um, it's, it's really hard to get a functioning service mesh. It's like way harder than it should be and I think if this whole, you know, system is, is going to work, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be not significantly harder than, you know, adopting Kubernetes itself. Like, it needs to be kind of like the next natural consequence and not like a whole new team and a whole new project. And so I've seen, you know, movement in that direction, but I wouldn't say we're there yet. Yeah, so I, I think in general, a lot of like the core traffic management APIs and stuff are, are kind of starting to show some maturity because we kind of see that implemented across uh, most of the service meshes and now we're starting to standardize on APIs and stuff there. Um, and then I was kind of just thinking about console specifically and, and where it's mature and where it needs to grow and it has kind of, so console has existed as a service discovery tool, um, um, kind of even before the concept of service mesh. And so it was kind of built with like heterogeneous environments in mind. And so I think like that's kind of an area where, where console uh, 
kind of has been battle tested over time. Um, and so I think as we, as we kind of build these things and over time improve on them, like we'll, we'll start to see maturity there. And then I think kind of a place where, where we're still growing, um, I guess I'll speak for console, but maybe, maybe other service meshes also feel that way. But I think, I think making it easier to use is still one of our, our biggest focuses. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think for me, um, one of the ways I've seen service meshes mature um, is that we've, we've got it in the hands of more people. Um, we've got more years under the belt of this word service mesh. And so because of that, I think that what we're seeing is a lot of validation of some of the problems that um, service mesh started off trying to solve. But we've also seen some areas where, you know, we anticipate as, you know, mesh being around, you know, five, six years, um, we anticipated certain problems uh, that would exist, and we haven't seen, or not that we haven't seen users have those problems, but they actually said, hey, what we really need is X, Y, Z. Um, one of the areas that comes to my mind uh, in my work on Open Service Mesh is around advanced use cases of PKI, PKI infrastructure, um, handling uh, CA uh, requirements, uh, compliance, uh, service meshes, entering into those conversations. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing customers come to us saying, hey, we know Mesh is how, to, how we solve these compliance issues. We know Mesh is how we get there now to come to William's point, uh, help us do that. Um, and that's where I think we need to mature. I think we need to give customers an easy button um, in order for it to, to just work. Nice. So, so speaking of an easy button, one of the things that we've heard a lot about at this conference and has had a lot of press releases recently is the Gateway API and now the Gamma Initiative, uh, which I think you guys represent four service meshes, and I think all of them are doing something with Gamma Initiative and Gateway API. So it's cool to see that. Uh, I think we call it coopetition. Um, very neat. But what does it what does it mean for a user that they can write a Gateway API for any of our service meshes? Why should that be important to them? I've, I've got the mic, so I'll start. Um, you know, I'm I'm really excited uh, at the work what we're able to do in Gateway API and Gamma, um, because here's what that means. Um, right now, if you're a user coming into Kubernetes, you learn, okay, I see the ingress resource exists. Um, in fact, Mitch, you were telling me earlier about your journey trying to use uh, something besides Istio, and you're like, okay, ingress is there, it's been mature, um, and so they, they you go towards ingress, and then, okay, now I've got my mesh, and I've got to learn, okay, instead of ingress, I've got to use this resource, and then I've got to set this config, and then I've got to that, this, that, or the other. Um, for, all for traffic routing. We're not even talking about, uh, you know, multi-cluster. We're talking about getting traffic into your into your Kubernetes cluster, which should be one of the more basic things that you're able to do when you sign on. Uh, and so with, with Gateway API, where you know, the, the people behind uh, who started that are reimagining the ways that we ingress traffic into your cluster. And then what we're doing with Gamma is we're looking to use those same APIs, those same primitives, those same concepts, uh, the same models, and use those for service mesh. So that way there's not that gap. There's not that jump from this resource to that resource to this resource. It's one set of resources, one set of configuration for traffic routing, for uh, we're exploring policy, uh, authorization policy. And that can be consistent across gateway uh, or across ingress and mesh use cases. And so from a user experience perspective and an education perspective, that's very exciting to me. Yeah, one thing I wanted to highlight, I mean, I see people, you know, looking at a, a neutral standard and thinking like, oh, that's great, I can move between service meshes or run two service meshes, but I don't actually care about that because like almost everyone else, I only run one service mesh, right? So I'm fine with just using their APIs. But I think that actually there's still a lot of benefits of the gateway API for those types of users, right? There's still a huge ecosystem uh, around APIs. So that's everything from documentation, tutorials, YouTube videos, that's integrations that are doing things like cert manager or external DNS or Argo CD or all these types of things, right? You know, some of those integrations, they may happen to integrate with your mesh. They may integrate with 15 meshes and have a huge maintenance overhead so they can't actually work on features. Um, you know, now there's just one API that's common for ingress for mesh to integrate across the board. 
Um, so I think we'll see a lot more integrations which will allow uh, kind of what I mentioned earlier, like actually expanding, take the service mesh and get the building blocks actually used for something useful. Um, so we'll see a lot of product offerings and we're already starting to see that on top of the Gateway API. I hate standards. Well, no, I wouldn't say I hate them, but I, I personally am not a believer in standards for their own sake. And I think for Linkerd especially, we've taken a very focused decision, which is we are going to do what's right for our users, kind of regardless of any, and, and everything, not regardless of anything else, but everything else has got to be secondary to that. And yet, and yet, despite that, you know, we did adopt the Gateway API in our most recent release for one very important reason, which is, well, A, it was really well designed, so kudos to everyone involved, um, and B, it solved a really important problem for us, which is that we needed mechanisms for Linkerd users to configure some of Linkerd's behavior, especially some of the newer stuff around route-based policies where you need ways of describing classes of HTTP traffic, and that's not an easy thing to do. And the Gateway API had done that in a really elegant way, in a really powerful way, and in a way that even though it wasn't designed for the service mesh kind of from the outset, it really worked for our use case. So we had to adopt it in kind of like a, a slightly funky way, which I hope to correct in the future, but it really solved an immediate problem for, for Linkerd, and that's why as soon as Keith and uh, you know, all the Gamma stuff kicked off, I was like, you know, even though hate standards or, uh, you know, don't care about them or, uh, you know, maybe I'm, at best I'm, I'm wary of them because I've seen them weaponized and I wrote a long blog post complaining about this. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're getting involved in this because I think it's really good for, uh, for Linkerd. So, you know, I guess I'm saying kudos and like keep up the good work. And if you mess up, then, you know, we're gone. We're out. Cool. Yeah, I think I'm going to end up plus winning a lot of what, what people said. So, yeah, it's exciting that, that hopefully uh, users of Service Mesh will be able to uh, focus less on the UX because that will be consistent and documented kind of across um, multiple meshes and stuff uh, and, and care more about their more advanced use cases and stuff. And I think uh, I'm excited especially excited to see how the APIs will evolve for kind of east-west traffic and also for multi-cluster and multi-platform. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point too, is that, you know, I, I think there is a nice world in the future where we can think about configuring our ingress traffic with the same, you know, with the same kind of core building blocks as our mesh traffic and configure the policies in the, in, in the same way. And that wasn't something that I had thought was really going to be, you know, a, a, a possibility, but it seems like it's in, it's it is a possibility now, and I think that would be really great for for users because at least from my experience, like one of the hardest parts of Kubernetes is just the fact that you have all these configuration objects that all have their own semantics, and you have to like figure out how to you know make that work. And this is why people complain about like oh I'm spending all my life in YAML now. You know it's not really YAML's fault. It's just like this is the mechanism by which we you know you have Kubernetes' power at your disposal. Right, and so getting that getting that right, and having a uh, an API that you know can both span the full breadth of use cases that you need, plus it makes sense and like kind of has these logical building blocks, really, really, uh, really, really important. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, again, I think Gateway API, API is awesome as an example. But nice. So one other trend that we've heard at the conference this year, and we heard about it at Service MeshCon Europe, uh, is sort of the sidecarless model for service meshes. Uh, I think actually just before this, we heard from Isovalent about Cilium and the way that they're doing sidecarless. We've also had a few sessions on Istio's new ambient mode uh, that is sidecarless. So what's the motivation behind these models and is, is it really still a service mesh without sidecars? I'm sure I can take this. I'll let William answer, is it a service mesh? I think he's the expert there, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so on, on sidecar lists, um, I mean, really, it's kind of a weird name, but, um, you know, the, we've ran into a lot of issues with running in sidecars around operations. Um, you know, it's hard to upgrade, it's hard to scale, it's hard to onboard and offboard dynamically, you need to restart your pods to upgrade. Um, that's one huge trend we see with Istio users is that they, you know, release CVE fixes and then users don't actually upgrade because it's too painful, right? 
Um, that's not something that you see as often with, say, your Ingress gateway because you can do a rolling restart and you know kind of gradually deploy it out. It doesn't impact their applications at all. Um, you know, some other things, the cost, every pod now has this sidecar process running, which even if it happened to be using almost no resources, you certainly have to request some resources for it, which has some overhead. Um, so we often see a lot of, if not CPU usage, CPU and memory requests that are just burning through users' budgets. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on, right? There's, there's all sorts of issues we've uncovered uh, with sidecars. Um, you know, there's also plenty of benefits, but we saw that a lot of users don't want to take on that cost of deploying a sidecar everywhere, and they still want to engage in service mesh features, whether that's using MTLS, telemetry, or kind of more rich features like L7 traffic routing, load balancing, right? Um, so that's kind of where the, the origins of, uh, you know, moving away from sidecars or offering alternatives to sidecars, I guess, would be, be more accurate description uh, come from. No. <laughs> no, no. I mean, no, that all seems, seems right. Like, you know, I, so <laughs> uh, this is another thing I've written a long blog post, you know, outlining all my complaints and, and opinions. But, um, you know, I, sidecars have a lot of problems, and there's a lot of, you know, kind of annoyances that you have to go through um, to, to navigate them. You know, of which you mentioned a couple. You know, the fact that pods are immutable in Kubernetes. So if you want to upgrade your sidecar, well, you got to roll the whole pod and 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 so on. Um, I believe that the sidecar model is still the best model from the perspective that I, you know, I am most interested in, which is kind of the operational simplicity one, because it's the one that is really understandable. It's the one where it's very clear, you know, what component maps to what, and especially as you start getting into the world of like zero trust security and all that stuff where you're trying to enforce everything at the most granular level, you have a very clear model. It's like, here is the sidecar. It enforces policy and TLS for this pod. It contains the secret for that pod, and everything is very straightforward from there. So uh, I don't want to discount the utility of you know non-sidecar uh, approaches, at least from the ambient perspective, which I believe preserves the security uh, things that I like about the sidecar model. But I think given the simplicity and given the fact that I, you know, these warts will largely be, well, you know, maybe it's me being optimistic. I think a lot of these warts will be fixed by Kubernetes at some point, you know, we'll figure out how to do startup order, you know, ordering and like all that other stuff. Um, you know, I, I've looked at the options and, you know, I, I'm, I continue to be a fan of the sidecar model and, and we continue to push that forward, you know, with kind of the underlying difference maybe being that we, we've been spending all this time trying to make our sidecar as small and as fast as possible to, to reduce the impact of the extra resource usage and, and, and so on. So it's, I think this is a, I think it's an interesting conversation to have because it's, it's a, it's a, there are a set of engineering and security trade-offs that you're making at every step here. Uh, and I don't, you know, as much as I'd like to say that's you're wrong and I'm right, because that's you know what I'd love to say. I, I don't think that's really the case. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. The, the Sidecar API has been the, coming in the next Kubernetes release, right? For the last, what, four, three, four years? <laughs> I'm optimistic. I think it's going to happen at some point. Maybe not that specific kep. So William, I saw on Twitter that, that you had a novel approach to a Sidecarless model for Linkerd. Did you want to walk us through that? Oh, you really want to hear about this? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think the best way to deliver... <laughs> if you really don't want to see the sidecar, like, I can just hide the sidecar from you, okay? So, like, I can give you a kube cuddle. If you want sidecarless Linkerd, I can deliver a kube cuddle, you know, that just, like, removes Linkerd from the output. And, in fact, we can use eBPF to do this, and then you get the best of both worlds. So we can have kube cuddle, you know, do the string manipulation in kernel land, which is incredibly fast, and efficient and bypasses all the network hops and we can harness the true power of eBPF. And then you get the best of both worlds. You have the sidecar model under the hood, but you never have to see the fact that you have a sidecar. You, you missed Wasm on my buzzword bingo. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, okay, I'll, I'll take another crack at it. Yeah. Should consider adding uh, S-bombs on there. Get the- Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> see, I, I think we're onto something here. Yeah, if there's any VCs in the audience, just know, you know, Seed startup, pre-seed coming soon. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, thinking about sidecars and sidecarless, um, I actually have kind of this this 
vision I'd like to see for, for Service Mesh where um, things are even more transparent. You know, Service Mesh took off as being a kind of transparent proxy. You put your sidecar, you inject your sidecar, um, you use the same URL, and then the magic just happens. You got traffic splitting, you get metrics, and it's just, it just works. Um, but, you know, at Open Service Mesh, um, when we were talking to a lot, a lot of our customers, um, what we're actually seeing is that uh, a lot of the, you know, you often hear the term like ownership, cost, cost of ownership. Um, a lot of our users, our customers are saying, even still, like we're, we just want MTLS. You know, we, we just want encryption. And uh, we've, we've striven uh, to try to make OSM as simple as possible. Um, but I, I can't help but feel that there is an easy, you know, an easy button still out there. And, you know, I've had lots of conversations here talking about uh, sidecarless ambient model, and it's something that we're taking a look at, we're evaluating. Um, but, you know, I would love to be in a reality to where if you want encrypted traffic between your services, you can just spin up a Kubernetes cluster in your cloud provider of choice, and it's just there. Um, no, you know, the, the identity can come from something hosted. The, the, you know, something in your cluster takes care of all that, and you don't have to see it. You don't have to worry about uh, your application container uh, restarting. And um, like I said, sidecarless is, is attractive to me because of how it aligns with that vision. But, you know, there's you know, so many different ways to, to skin the proverbial cat. And uh, I'm just looking forward to, you know, doing more research and seeing if we can't make that vision a reality someday. Yeah, I think I think on console we also we see the potential of, of these sidecarless architectures and and kind of the issues that people have been running into with sidecars. Um, and yeah, so I think we're just kind of looking into it and seeing where it might make sense to incorporate. Okay, I, I just want to respond to Keith's, Keith's point because you know we also see that right. We see a lot of people who are coming to Linkerd and they're like, yeah, you know. Why, you know, I'm like, why are you doing this? Oh, okay, because we want MTLS. You know, we need encryp encryption of, tra of traffic and transit. And they're like, they're like apologetic. They're like, you know, I, I know Linkerd has all this other cool stuff, but like, this is all we need. Um, and I'm like, well, if you just care about encryption and transit, like, you, you know, just you know, IPsec or like, you know, like you can do this. After, you don't need a service mesh for any of this. If you dig in, what we find is often, you know, they're using encryption and kind of like this very loose word where like, well, we don't just want encryption, we want like policy, right? And we want policy at like the layer seven level and, and stuff. And so like once you start unwinding what they actually want, it gets much closer to, oh, this is something that we're gonna have to solve in layer seven one way or another than just like, oh, we can slap IPsec on it and like, hey, everything's encrypted, the regulators are, are happy or whatever. So, you know, often I, I find we have to kind of educate, you know, um, some of the would-be adopters like, MTL, if all you really care about is encryption and like that's it, like MTLS is total overkill for that. There's no reason, you know, it's, it's, it's really only once you start caring about workload identity and, you know, and policy enforcement and zero trust and blah, 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 that starts making a lot more sense. So you all talked a lot about, you know, the sort of operational burden. How should users be thinking about the total cost of ownership of a service mesh, not just onboarding, but all through the life cycle of their adoption. How do they compare and contrast? How do they prepare for total cost of ownership? And what do you all do to help mitigate the total cost of ownership for your users? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, when I think about total cost of ownership, that includes things like operating your service mesh, scale, upgrades, uh, how does it fit with how your organization is structured? Um, and so I guess one example of that is that when you install a service mesh, you have a bunch of secrets and certificates that are associated with it. And I guess the default kind of thing for managing those secrets now is, is to use Kubernetes secrets. Um, and Maybe if you're in like a multi-cluster setup or something, or, or you're federating those, then you're copying Kubernetes secrets from one cluster to the other. And I guess one way that that console kind of helps with with that problem of, of secrets management is is just by having a, a tight integration with with Vault, which is an open source tool for um, managing your credentials securely. 
So console can offload to vault a lot of the, the operational things with secrets management. So storing those secrets securely, authorizing access to them, and um, and also like managing operations like rotation of your control plane certs. So um, so yeah, so that's kind of a way that that console tries to reduce that that part of the cost of ownership. And then I think another thing we're kind of seeing is is kind of the rise of, of managed service meshes to help um, manage the cost of, of operating that, that control plane. Um, and yeah, I guess what else are we doing on console? Like we've also been working on on kind of uh, reducing the complexity of, of just like a console deployment so that there's less components to upgrade and and less times that you need to do an upgrade by making more of the versions compatible with each other. So, yeah. Yeah, total cost of ownership is a, it's a, I, I, I like the term, but I don't feel like it completely encompasses the nuance in the conversation. Um, so if you want to use a service mesh and you want canary deployments, there are lots of ways to do that wrong. Not, not necessarily wrong, but lots of ways to do that that aren't up to, say, quote unquote, industry standard. Um, I did a talk uh, a couple months ago walking through kind of the evolution of networking and Kubernetes. And you know, the, 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 one of the points that I made that I think is applicable here is that organizations have to make decisions based on their problems based on the things they're trying to accomplish, whatever it is they're trying to solve. Um, now, nowadays, if you want a, some, some, a production-ready service in the cloud that looks very much like the way that giant cloud providers, giant companies deploy their software, um, and that means you've got the complexity of those uh, giant companies. Um, but you might not have the resources for that. And so for a, a service mesh, it, this is all a long way to say that service meshes are very powerful pieces of technology. They're, they can do a lot of really cool things. And of course, people are going to point to it and say, yes, I want that um, because it claims to do it simply. But you know, at the end of the day, you are basically running another layer of networking through your cluster. Um, and at, at that point, you are as a organization accepting, unless your mesh is managed, um, you're accepting some responsibility um, for understanding what's happening, for uh, responding to incidents. Um, again, unless you get managed support from somebody, you don't get to just call someone and say, hey, something's not working. Um, it requires you know, deep, un a relatively deep understanding to be able to debug and to, and to operationalize. So um, I, say, I say all that to say that the total costs of ownership of a service mesh, if you're running it yourself, is, is probably more than you think. Um, if you are fortunate enough to be at a company where you've got a dedicated platform team, then excellent. That's great growth opportunity to learn what's going on, to be involved in open source, which I'm always an advocate of, having come from a back end, from, from an end user company. Um, but I would just say kind of uh, beware. And as much as all of us and our respective uh, projects can try to simplify things, there is an inherent cost to running something and getting some of these uh, features, so. And yeah. software sucks. <laughs> I, it, yeah, in a lot of ways, I think, yeah, software sucks. You, you love it, you hate it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, from our perspective as, you know, developers of service meshes, you know, we try and chip away at the friction points that users hit. Um, you know, small issues to big issues like the Kubernetes cap, gateway API, ambient, those types of things. But there's also, you know, the burden on the user. There's, there's never going to be a service mesh, I would imagine, that you just press a button and you never have to think about anything at all about how a service mesh runs or what it does, right? Um, you have to have some level of knowledge of what's going on in the system, um, just like you do with Kubernetes or even Linux or, you know, whatever you look at that you're running. Um, so my recommendation would be to digest it slowly, right? There's no need to <laughs> go use all... 14 Istio custom resources on your first day, right? Most users are adopting a service mesh for some particular reason. Maybe they want ingress. Start with ingress. Add sidecars later as you need them. Or maybe they want MTLS. Just do MTLS first. 
worry about canary deployments later once you've got experience and have, you know time to learn and onboard your team and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm all on the managed service mesh train. I think that the number one cheapest way to actually operate a service mesh in production is to use a managed solution. Not coincidentally, I also sell a managed Linkerd solution, which I highly recommend that you adopt immediately and come see me after this talk and I'll tell you it's extremely expensive, but it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's funny because you know we, we kind of we pick it you know we pick on Istio all day and we talk about you know hey Linkerd is faster and Linkerd is lighter and like latency is lower and you know I, I like doing that just because I'm kind of a mean person and also because it's true but at the <laughs> at the end of the day like what we find is that that stuff doesn't really matter to you know the people who are adopting Linkerd they don't really you know an extra millisecond here there you know, like their database takes like 500 milliseconds you know their application takes like 700 milliseconds they, they've got much bigger fish to fry than like you know these tiny tiny little millisecond here and there uh, and the resource consumption is the same thing like you know it's much easier for them to throw more memory at the problem than to pay the really expensive cost which is the human beings that they have to pay to operate this thing so we find again and again that like the expensive, you know, the, the real cost driver, number one, like biggest, uh, you know, kind of factor in here is the humans that you have to dedicate to that. And, you know, of course we try and make Linkerd as simple as possible. And, you know, a simplicity for me is this like really, uh, you know, like long conversation about uh, simple versus easy and, you know, rich hickey and like all this stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of how Linkerd has, has been designed is with that, you know, philosophy kind of consciously in mind. It's also why we're adopting the Gateway API. Like, you know, those, if those CRDs are going to be on your cluster anyways, okay, you know, well, now you don't have to learn. We don't have to introduce anything new. So, like, you're kind of, like, sticking to Kubernetes, as, you know, surface area as much as possible. But at the end of the day, like, human beings are, like, the expensive and, and, and horrible parts of this. So reducing, you know, the amount of humans involved is, in my opinion, best way to reduce your TCO for a service mesh. Put everyone in this room out of a job as rapidly as possible. That's my advice. I'm sorry, we already went. I've lost track. So each of you touched on, when, in terms of total cost of ownership, sort of power and simplicity of service mesh across the board, regardless of which product you're talking about. How do you go about balancing those things for your users, giving them something that is powerful, but simple enough that they maybe can't shoot themselves in the foot with it. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in, you know, in the beginning Start of Start with the worst offender. Go ahead, John. <laughs> We're ready. We're listening. In the, if this was three years ago, I would say it's all shifted to power, right? We just, you know, Istio originally had many, many features. We've actually, in many ways, I had to reduce the number of features over the past few years rather than added to them, right? Um, you know, as we found out what, what was important to users, what belonged in the core project versus integrations, that sort of thing, uh, to try and simplify the offering. But, um, you know, today and moving forward, I think it's really about layering. Um, so, you know, once you have a proxy, there's a tendency to want to put everything that you could possibly ever want to do there, right? It's like, oh, why don't I just compile my entire application of Wasm and put it in the proxy, right, as an extreme. Um, but, you know, we have to, you know, draw boundaries, like, do we want to be a full-fledged API gateway? Probably not, but someone out there does, and they should do that, and then we should integrate with them, right? Um, you know, we've done similar things with the ambient mesh where we're splitting out, like, the L4 encryption layer from the L7 processing, those sort of things. So it's really not about, like, restricting, you know, features and, and that sort of thing to provide simplicity, but having different layers that users can choose, like, at what layer they need to solve their problem at so that they don't need to digest everything at once in, you know, one product. Big plus one on the layering. Um, that's one of the reasons I love open source so much. Um, and it's awesome to see a conference like this with people working you know, often in the open to provide accessibility points so that software can layer on top of software. Um, when you are talking about balancing power and, and simplicity, um, I, for, for those of us who like who use uh, Envoy as, as a proxy, it's pretty darn complicated. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to go and uh, program, that's why meshes do that for you. Uh, at least Envoy-based meshes do that for you. Um, 
And so I, I, I think that's a model to think about moving forward. If meshes, you know, Kubernetes provides one level, uh, one layer of, um, you know, uh, functionality, then maybe Envoy provides another, but then mesh is an interface for that. Um, and by doing this work out in the open, by creating extensible, flexible APIs, I think we paved the way forward for people to come after us and to add more layers on top of that. Um, Gateway API, Gamma is, is, is one area where I think that happens. Um, it was, um, you know, it's awesome to be, to, to be part of uh, SMI as well and, and see things like Argo rollouts and Flagger uh, built on top of that to provide progressive delivery. Um, they, I think I saw Flagger announce Gateway API support um, moving in, in that direction, that's awesome. Um, I think we end up creating a better ecosystem for everybody uh, when we can uh, you know, provide those extensibility points, provide those layers, uh, and help users strike their own balance for power versus simplicity. Because there's, there's no one answer. Uh, there's, you're gonna have your power users, you're gonna have your easy button users. And the, the challenge of software is to try to provide uh, a product or a project with enough knobs to where it works for both. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, when I, when I was thinking about power and simplicity, I feel like, yeah, across many meshes, we're seeing this kind of shift and focus on, on making it easier to use. Like a lot of them have really powerful features at this point. Um, and so I think a lot of it will just be like continuing to look back at the models that, that we've built and, and rethink them and, and iterate on them. Uh, and so, yeah, like I guess an example of this in console is that we had kind of a model of, of federation, so connecting services across clusters that existed for a really long time. And, and we kind of rethought about it from, from the ground up. And, and the reasons for that were because the old model of federation wasn't really suited towards how organizations uh, kind of manage their infrastructure today. So like we see a lot more of like teams managing their own uh, infrastructure. So like team A is gonna own a couple of Kates clusters and that's where they're deploying stuff and team B might be uh, deploying stuff on another set of clusters. So. Um, yeah, so the kind of original model didn't fit so well with that, and so we rethought it, kind of made it so that, you know, things could be more decoupled. And, um, and yeah, so I think just kind of rethinking models uh, as, as we kind of mature over time will kind of help um, bring that simplicity back. And then, and then the other thing I think is still just like, yeah, managed service meshes. <laughs> I think I think you know taking taking the the cost of operating the control plane out of the user's hands is it just it does make it a lot easier to still be able to have the power of, of all these service meshes, but but without needing to operate it. So the the question was how, how do you balance features and and simplicity? Yeah, so I you know I think it's probably one of the core questions of of any kind of software, not just the service mesh. You know, where like you don't want to end up with, like the worst is you end up with like a leaky abstraction where, you know, you're describing this beautiful model, but if you use it in this one way, you actually, you know, have all these other in unintended consequences, like performance is way worse than if you use it in this other way, you know, and, and, and I think for Linkerd, you know, we think about this every time we add features, and this was part of why we were, you know, really reluctant until Gateway API came up to, to add things like path-based routing was, you know, my, I just envisioned the poor like Kubernetes SRE who's like, you know, just been tasked with adopting Kubernetes and now it's trying to learn a service mesh and like they've just absorbed like 200 CRDs and you know, this whole model of, you know, you put the, the code goes in the, you know, goes in the container, which becomes an image, which goes in the pod, which goes behind the replica set, which goes behind the deployment, which goes behind the ingress. And you know, what I like about Kubernetes is like that stuff makes sense. Like they're all, they're logical and the pieces fit together, but there's a lot there's a lot there to absorb. And you think of that poor person who's just, you know, had to come up to, to speed with all that, and then you're introducing a service mesh, and now there's like 70 more CRDs. So a lot of our focus has been, how do we make this, you know, feel and smell as much like Kubernetes as possible, you know? So when you're, when you're learning it, you can at least kind of relate it to all these other things that you've just absorbed. And, 
you know, uh, uh, there's, there's like so many nuances in how you in, in how you do that. But I think for us, that's that's been kind of the, the principle: is make this make this you know stick as tightly as possible to the surface area of Kubernetes, uh, make it feel and smell like the rest of Kubernetes. And of course, you know, as soon as you get outside of Kubernetes, and like things start breaking down, right? And then you know, like you don't really necessarily have that to to um, uh, to, to rely on. So it only takes you so far. But at least within the context of the cluster, we can give it to you in like familiar terms. So that's kind of like the configuration side. And then there's also the operational side, which is like, okay, I'm now I'm running 10,000, you know, Linkerd proxies or 10,000 envoys. You know, what is that like? How much tuning am I doing? And how much, you know, how much uh, do I have to become an envoy expert to do this versus an Istio expert? Or how much do I have to become a Linkerd proxy expert versus a Linkerd expert? And that, you know, I don't know that there's a good solution there. You know, I think that's that's just like, how do you write software that's really predictable to do and uh, to, to run? And, and when you run it, you know, you can build a mental model of what it's going to do. And if it violates that model, then you can be like, oh, that's weird. As opposed to like, oh, it's just a magical thing. And like, I don't really know what's going on here. Because that's when you get into like the dark territory of like, I don't know. We'll just try rebooting it and see if it works any better, right? And like, yes, that's an approach, but it's, it's not like the good approach. So it's all to say, I don't know, man, this is really hard. It's a really hard problem. It's one that we struggle with, and I think that one that anyone who is trying to develop software meant to be consumed by other human beings has to struggle with on a, on a regular basis. That makes sense. Well, we're out of time for today, so let's hear a round of applause for our panelists.